These are the offices of the Waqf, which is the Islamic Trust, which has control, the custodial responsibilities of the Temple Mount. They're the Muslim Trust that says who and who cannot enter to the Temple Mount. Sometimes they restrict the Jews and the Christians from going up to what is the most sacred piece of real estate for both the Jewish and the Muslim people. And the location of the Mufti, the Mufti of Jerusalem, Sheikh Shabri. Recently I met with the Mufti of Jerusalem right here in the old city of Jerusalem in the Muslim quarter. I had a conversation with him in his office here off the site of the what is known by the Muslims as the Holy Sanctuary. How long back does the history for Al-Aqsa go for the Muslim people? How far back? For us as Muslims, Al-Aqsa Mosque is belonging to us before the Prophet Adam is here in the realm. In a meeting that I had with the Sheikh, he told me that there is no evidence that there's ever been a presence of the Jewish people on the Temple Mount throughout all of time. In fact, in our conversation, he said that the mosque that is on the Temple Mount dates back to the time of the Garden of Eden. Indication that even the Muslim people believe that the Garden of Eden, the original site of the Garden of Eden, is on the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem. From this vantage point here on the Mount of Olives, to look across the Kidron Valley, seeing the old city of Jerusalem, the new city of Jerusalem, I think of the holy city, as Nehemiah referred to it as, Jerusalem. Almost beautiful, even in the statement of the name of the city. In Hebrew, Harushalayim, has a musical sound to it. In the Bible, the word Jerusalem is used some 764 times. First referred to over in Genesis when the priest king Melchizedek came from Salem. Psalms tells us that is referring to the city of Jerusalem. But the word itself first used in Joshua chapter 10 and verse 1, talking about a battle that the children of Israel under the leadership of Joshua would have had with one of the kings of the five city-states that had come against the Israelites. And one of those kings was from Jerusalem. Chapter 21, verse 10 in the book of Revelation, talking about the new Jerusalem, the last time that the word Jerusalem is used. The marvelously beautiful city. Today, Jerusalem, the modern-day city, eight and a half square miles. Within the confines of the wall that you see here in the foreground, is the old city of Jerusalem, about a mile square. But where that gold-domed building is, that's the location of the most important piece of real estate in all of creation, the Temple Mount. And that is the focus in God's Word when He speaks about Jerusalem. This is not only a beautiful city. This is not only the city that, according to the book of Ezekiel, Chapter 5 and verse 5 is the center of the entire earth. It will be the center of controversy as well. Jerusalem, Harushalayim, the center of the earth, as I mentioned, that Ezekiel conveys to us in his prophecy, Ezekiel 5.5. 5. In Zechariah, the angel of the Lord appeared unto the ancient Jewish prophet. And when you see that phrase, the angel of the Lord, that is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. He tells Zechariah in chapter 1 and verse 14, I am jealous for Jerusalem. I like the Hebrew. It expands that thought just a bit farther. It says, I am aggressively possessive for Jerusalem. Psalm chapter 132 says, God has chosen Jerusalem to dwell among his people forever and forever. Thus, Zechariah refers to the city of Jerusalem in chapter 12 and verse 2 as a cup of trembling. 
In other words, intoxicating and a burdensome stone, a weight too heavy to carry. There is a reason that Jerusalem will be the center focus of all end times activities. And on this video, we want to explain that reason. Why is it the Muslim world claims Jerusalem as its third most sacred spot, Mecca, Medina in Saudi Arabia, and then Jerusalem, the third most sacred spot to the Islamic world? The Christians, they honor Jerusalem because Jesus Christ was here. He departed from right here on the Mount of Olives. He will return to Jerusalem. He will rule and reign in the temple that will stand where that gold dome building stands today on this sacred piece of real estate. And the Jewish people? Well, behind me are the graves here on the Mount of Olives. The Jewish people anticipate the coming of the Messiah right here to the Mount of Olives and then going across the Kidron Valley up onto the Temple Mount to rule and reign, to establish that kingdom that the prophet Daniel had promised to the Jewish people many years ago. There is a reason that Jerusalem will be so controversial. That's what we would like to get into and explain to you in our study on this video presentation of the return to Eden. Down through the centuries, God has given great significance to the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, the location where that gold dome building stands, the Dome of the Rock. It's the location where the temple one day will stand, Messiah's temple, the temple where Jesus Christ will rule and reign for a thousand years during his millennial kingdom. But 4,000 years ago, God told Abraham to bring his son Isaac from Beersheba, which is about 65 miles southwest of Jerusalem bring him here to Mount Moriah to the Temple Mount and to offer him as a sacrifice unto him. Of course, Abraham was obedient. Bringing Isaac to this spot was ready to kill him when God interceded and gave him a ram. The ram was caught by his horn in the thicket. By the way, the ram's horn, the shofar, the instrument that God will use to call all the Jewish people back here to the city of Jerusalem during his millennial kingdom in the future. A thousand years after that, King David here in the city of Jerusalem selected this spot to set up his headquarters for his kingdom of all 12 tribes of the children of Israel. He had been king of the tribe of Judah seven years in Hebron, and then all 12 tribes wanted him to be their king, so he selected a neutral spot. He chose Jerusalem, which at that time was a Jebusite stronghold. He comes to Jerusalem, he captures what is referred to in 2 Samuel as the city of David, or Zion, or Jerusalem, synonymous terms all referring to the same spot. He set it up as the political and the spiritual capital for the Jewish people some 3,000 years ago. King David wanted to build a house for the Lord, a permanent dwelling place. They had been using the tabernacle, a transportable worship center, but David wanted to have a permanent worship center, a temple. God would not allow him to build the temple, but in 2 Samuel chapter 7, he gave him the Davidic covenant, telling him that his son, Solomon, would build the temple. David collected all the materials, got the money together to build the temple, and put together the manpower. He passed from the scene, and then Solomon built the first temple that stood on the Temple Mount on Mount Moriah behind me. We know the story, of course, of the Babylonian captivity when the Jewish people were out of this land for 70 years. Then God raised up Zerubbabel. Cyrus, who was the head of the Medes and the Persians, gave Zerubbabel and about 50,000 Jews the right to come back to Jerusalem, come back to Mount Moriah, to the Temple Mount, and to rebuild the temple. That was the beginning of the second temple period, Zerubbabel's temple. In 168 BC, a man named Antiochus Epiphanes came into Jerusalem walked onto the Temple Mount, into the location where that Dome of the Rock is, into Zerubbabel's temple, and desecrated the temple by slaughtering a pig on the altar. 
The book of Daniel, chapter 11, refers to that as the abomination of desolation. Interestingly, three years to the day after Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple, God raised up the Maccabees, a group of Jewish zealots who ran Antiochus Epiphanes out of the area, went back into the temple, reconsecrated the temple, finding a menorah with just enough oil to burn one day, and tradition says miraculously it burned for eight days. That gave the Jewish people their special holy day of the Feast of Dedication, or as you may have heard of it, called Hanukkah. Several years after that, Herod the Great came to power under the Roman government and decided he wanted to refurbish Zerubbabel's temple, which was a rather simple temple at the time. It took him 46 years until the time of Jesus Christ, because Jesus refers to that work going on for those 46 years in John chapter 2. The rabbis said when Herod's temple stood here in Jerusalem, if you'd never seen Herod's temple, you'd never seen a beautiful building. That all happening on the Temple Mount on Mount Moriah, which is in the background behind me where that gold dome building stands. It was in 70 AD, I believe in fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus Christ gave right here on the Mount of Olives, that there would not be a stone standing upon a stone on that Temple Mount. The Roman army, who had been bivouacked here on the Mount of Olives under the leadership of General Titus, marched across the Kidron Valley in the Eastern Gate onto the Temple Mount, destroyed the temple. They devastated the city of Jerusalem and they dispersed the Jews to the four corners of the earth. There is a long history, a long history of controversy surrounding the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah. The location behind me that is going to be controversial in the time of the end. In the last days, as Zechariah the prophet has told us, Jerusalem becomes a cup of trembling, a burdensome stone. I've come here to the Mount of Olives to talk with you about the importance of the Mount of Olives, as well as the Temple Mount, where the gold dome building, the Dome of the Rock, stands behind me. These two locations will be very controversial at the time of the end, the time of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ancient Jewish prophet Zechariah speaks of what will be happening here in the city of Jerusalem at that time. In his 12th chapter, and in verses 2 and 3, he says, Behold, I make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judea and Jerusalem. And then he says, and he uses a phrase talking about the day just prior to the return of Jesus Christ here to the Mount of Olives, and in that day, a period of time talking about the seven-year tribulation leading up to the return of Jesus Christ. And in that day will I make Jerusalem my burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Zechariah the prophet talks about not a time when an olive branch is offered in peace, but a time when Jerusalem will become a cup of trembling, a burdensome stone, a cup of trembling. That takes me back to the book of Proverbs, where it talks about when the cup is full of the juice of the vine and it starts to move. That means that it is intoxicating. I believe Zechariah the prophet is talking about when he uses the phrase, a cup of trembling a time when there will be people who become intoxicated with power over the control that they have over that Temple Mount and the city of Jerusalem. Let me just explain, for example, that the first temple stood there where that Dome of the Rock is for 400 years. The second temple, Herod's temple, the one that was standing at the time of Jesus Christ, stood there for approximately 600 years, for a total of about 1,000 years. That Dome of the Rock was built there in 691 and has been standing on the spot where the first and second temples stood for over 1,300 years. But in addition to that, I was here as a journalist to cover when President Clinton the first time came into Jerusalem. He asked if he could go on to the Temple Mount. He had never been there. The mayor of Jerusalem, Ehud Omar, said, Mr. President, I'll be happy to be your guide. When he said that, Yasser Arafat went livid. And in fact, he had his armed guards lock all seven gates that enter into the Temple Mount. He stood there and he said, nobody can go onto this Temple Mount 
except I lead them. Here a terrorist told the most powerful man from the most powerful nation in all of the world that he could not come up onto the Temple Mount. Someone has become intoxicated with power. But Zechariah in verse 3 says, Jerusalem will become a burdensome stone. I believe he's talking about a weight that is too heavy to pick up. It is a weight on those who are trying to take Jerusalem and the Temple Mount away from God's purpose for it. You see, God did have a purpose for that spot. In fact, in the book of Psalms, chapter 132, God says, I have chosen Jerusalem, and in particular the Temple Mount, to build my house where I will dwell among my people forever. Why will Jerusalem and the Temple Mount be so controversial in the last days? Well, I believe there are several reasons. Number one, there is an Islamic attitude that this is the third most holy spot in all of the world for them. Mecca and Medina, both in Saudi Arabia, would be the most sacred spot and the second most sacred spot for the Islamic faith. But then they claim that Jerusalem is the third most holy site for the Muslim people. I would question that as being true fact because the Quran does not even mention the city of Jerusalem. It never says that the prophet of the Islamic faith, Muhammad, ever came to Jerusalem. There's inference, and many have concluded that that's exactly what happened. Tradition says that he was on a horse and lifted off of Jerusalem to go into the heavenlies. But in addition to that, there is a tenet to the Islamic faith that says this. Once a piece of real estate, a piece of property, was within the Islamic control, and the Temple Mount has been under Islamic control two times in history and now even a third time. Howbeit, the Israeli government has sovereignty over the Temple Mount. Technically, the Jewish people have no right to go onto the Temple Mount, and practically, the Islamic faith, the Islamic trust that has administrative responsibilities, custodial responsibilities on the Temple Mount, are in control of that very sacred spot, in fact, the most sacred spot in all of creation for the Jewish people. But at one time, that particular piece of geography was in the control of the Islamic people, which put it in then to the House of Islam. And the Islamic people believe that once a piece of geography is in the House of Islam, nobody else can ever have control of it, especially be in that land and prosper in that land, which is exactly what the Jewish people are doing today. Those are some of the reasons that in the last days, that spot behind me, the Temple Mount, where the Dome of the Rock is, where one day Messiah's temple will be, will be very controversial. It will become a cup of trembling, a burdensome stone. Not too long ago, I was talking with a rabbi, Rabbi Cham Richman. He works with the Temple Institute, the people who are on the cutting edge to prepare to build the next temple that will stand there on the Temple Mount. He made a very interesting statement to me. He said, today we are living in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 2. Rabbi Richmond, recently when I was interviewing you on my radio broadcast Prophecy Today, you made the statement that we are living in the day that the ancient Jewish prophet Zechariah described in chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, that Jerusalem would become a cup of trembling and a burdensome stone. What did you mean by that? How are we living in that day? First thing, I think when we study the Bible, we see very clearly that everywhere Jerusalem is um, tantamount. It's, it's the symbol of everything that's good and right in the world, the presence of the one true God, the place that the Creator chose to make His uh, existence and presence manifest to all mankind. Jerusalem is a symbol of um, the divine side of life and the ability of humanity to hook up and connect with its loftier potential. Uh, all throughout the Bible we see that this is the unique status of Jerusalem, the one place on earth that God has chosen. And the theme is developed throughout the prophets, the prophecy that you are mentioning now as well as many others, that the time will come when uh, 
people will have to take a stand for the side of good, the side of God, which is really taking a stand for Jerusalem on a symbolic level. You know that the Jewish people all throughout the world for the past 2,000 years have turned and faced Jerusalem in prayer mm -hmm. from wherever they happen to be. Daniel in Babylonian captivity turned and faced Jerusalem. And mm -hmm. I think that this idea of physically facing Jerusalem is not only a question of uh, aligning ourselves and drawing our spiritual sustenance from the place of the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, but also showing that we stand literally for Jerusalem. And now, as we see uh, for quite a, a bit of time now, as you and I well know, we've discussed this many times in the past, um, the Muslim Authority is um, in a heated campaign to desecrate and destroy the remnants of the Holy Temple from the Temple Mount in an effort to uh, re rewrite history, to erase Jewish history from the city of Jerusalem. Um, this has been going on for some time now. This is only one part of a whole campaign to wrest the city of Jerusalem away from the Jewish people. Just last week, you know, an exhibit was opened, a new exhibit was opened, a virtual tour of Jerusalem near the Western Wall. And the um, Muslim Waqf, as well as the um, Islamic movement, the Israeli Arabs, protested very bitterly. And they said, well, how could it be that the president of the state of Israel, Moshe Katsav, was present at the inauguration of this project, which is a perversion of history. And mm. they called it a perversion of history because it presents Jewish Jerusalem in the time of the temple. And as far as they're concerned, it's impossible for anyone to state there's no proof and there's no uh, academic or historical reason to ever state that Jerusalem was ever a Jewish city. So they're incensed over the fact that we are actually portraying Jerusalem as having a Jewish past. And this issue is becoming more and more pointed and becoming more and more the core issue of really the survival of the Jewish people. Because everything boils down to where we are going. Is this a Jewish city? Meaning, do the Jewish people have a right to the one city which is theirs, the one city which has never been an Arab capital or the capital of any other people in the world? And it's not only a question of the relationship between the Jewish people and Jerusalem, it's a question of the status, of the destiny, mm. of the purpose of the Jewish people in the world. And all of that is coming about right now. The first time that I ever considered that the Temple Mount may well be the Garden of Eden was when I was here in Jerusalem doing my live nationwide radio broadcast, the call-in program Prophecy Today. On the broadcast, I was interviewing Rabbi Chaim Richman. I was in my studio here in Gilo, and the rabbi was at his home. We were talking about the destruction that was taking place on the Temple Mount. The Muslims were in the process of constructing the largest mosque in all of the Middle East, on the Temple Mount. In the course of our conversation, we discussed the importance of the Temple Mount to the Jewish people. We referred back to the time when Abraham brought Isaac to Mount Moriah to offer him in sacrifice, when David bought from Ornan the Jebusite, the threshing floor, which would be right under that gold dome building behind me, the Dome of the Rock, when King Solomon, David's son, built the first temple to stand there, and then when Zerubbabel returned from the Babylonian captivity with about 50,000 Jewish people, and they built the second temple there. We also even talked about the fact that Jesus Christ was on that temple mount. He would go and teach in front of the temple. Many times in the scriptures you can read of Jesus Christ not only teaching but healing there on the temple mount, a very sacred piece of real estate to the Jewish people and to Christians alike. Well, in the course of the conversation, Chaim said to me, it's so important because that is the foundation stone. And I said, the foundation stone? I didn't recognize that phrase. Chaim said, well, that's where God created Adam. And I was taken back just a moment. Now, I didn't know what he was talking about. And so I guess the best decision for me was to not continue that conversation any farther until I could find out more of what he was talking about and not show my complete ignorance right there on a live radio broadcast. And so we made an arrangement, set an appointment to get together, and he would continue his teaching to me of what the Jewish people have believed for almost 6,000 years, that the Temple Mount is the original site to the Garden of Eden. Where that gold-domed building is in that vicinity stood the first temple of the second temple, and the next temple will stand there as well. And underneath that Dome of the Rock, there is a foundational stone. 
You mentioned to me as well in that radio broadcast that the foundation of all of creation took place on the Temple Mount area. This Can you elaborate we on that? Taught. The tradition is that the very center of the spiritual and creative universe is the place of the foundation stone on the Temple Mount. It was here from which Adam was created. It was here upon which Abraham uh, bound Isaac and upon which Jacob laid his head and saw the vision of the ladder and upon which stood the Ark of the Covenant in the time of the Temple. And this is the spiritual switchboard of the whole world. Uh, according to tradition, the Temple Mount and the area of the Holy of Holies is actually also the center of the Biblical Garden of Eden. Hmm. And so then Adam and Eve would have been located here in Jerusalem on that Temple Mount area, the Garden of Eden at that time of creation. And this, this equation really fits very well uh, according to Jewish teaching and tradition because the whole role that the Temple plays in the life of mankind and the spiritual fulfillment of humanity is as a means of rectifying the spiritual relationship between God and man. So this is where it all began. And then afterwards, this is where the Kohanim who caused the influx of divine energy and radiance and blessing to come into the world, the priests serving in the Temple, this is where they deal with the whole balance between man and God and causing all of this to be perfect in its relationship. The Dome of the Rock is the Dome which stands upon the, the Rock. The Rock is the stone, the foundation stone of the world where God begins the creation, where the Garden of Eden and where the, God's actual presence in the world begins and connects heaven to earth. One of our studies together, and I enjoy those so very much, you mentioned that actually Jewish tradition says the creation of Adam actually took place where the altar of the temple would be standing. Why was that? There is a teaching that since the altar in the temple atones for mankind, how fitting it is, just as the sages teach, that God always creates a cure before he creates the illness. So also man was created from the very spot which atones for him and for his descendants. Of course, there was, a, at the time, when creation took place, a theocracy in this world. When man fell into sin, that was set aside. But then one day when Messiah comes to that temple that you and your people are preparing to build, theocracy once again will be instituted here on this earth. Is that, would you, would you agree? I wouldn't define it exactly okay. that way in that uh, our goal towards the rebuilding of the temple is not to facilitate the coming of the Messiah, but to facilitate the commandment of God. And this is something that we've discussed many times, some of the differences that we have in our uh, outlook about the role of the Messiah. But in general, uh, I'm in agreement with uh, your, the spirit of your statement that the role that the rebuilt temple has uh, is a role of um, helping to facilitate the spiritual realignment of all humanity back to the underpinnings, the spiritual bedrock which we all were created from, and that is um, the knowledge that the uh, most precious thing in this world is the relationship that we have with God. In any discussion on the authentic location of the Garden of Eden, and I'm speaking of the original Garden of Eden now, there are three texts in the Word of God that we must deal with. The first one is found in Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 3. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. Now remember, Zion, Jerusalem, and the city of David are synonymous terms in the Bible. When you read either one of those names or that phrase, city of David, they're all referring to the city of Jerusalem. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, or Jerusalem. He will comfort her waste places, and he will make her wilderness, and the King James says, like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Well, the words like are not in the original Hebrew. So the text would then read, for the Lord shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all of her waste places, and he will make her wilderness, Eden, and her desert, the garden of the Lord. In other words, the garden of Eden. Over in the 36th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36 of Ezekiel is dealing with the land of Israel, and 35 times in the text it refers to the land. It's a promise that God has given to the Jewish people that they shall have this land forever and ever and ever. 
Here in chapter 36 and verse 35 it says, And they shall say, This land that was desolate, and again the King James says, is become like the Garden of Eden. But that phrase, is become like, is not in the Hebrew text. So it would read, And they shall say, This land that was desolate, the Garden of Eden. There's one other passage we need to deal with, and that's in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, it's talking about the day of the Lord. And in chapter 2 and verse 2, it speaks as the day begins, and any Jewish day begins at night, you might well remember, and then concludes the next sundown the next day. So he's using that thought, that Hebrew thought, that Jewish philosophy, to talk about a day of darkness and of gloominess. That's how the day of the Lord and of course, the day of the Lord any time in history when God intercedes in the affairs of man personally on the earth. The day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. And a great people and a strong people, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. He's speaking here of a mighty militia, the largest militia that has ever been formed on the face of the earth. They will gather in the day of the Lord at that time approaching the second coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth the land. And the land is as the garden of Eden before them. I must repeat what I've said in the other verses is as is in italics in my King James Bible, meaning that's interpolation, not interpretation of the original Hebrew script. So it would say, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land, the garden of Eden before them, that mighty militia making their way here to Jerusalem, to the original site of the garden of Eden, well, that's what we want to talk about as we continue our study of the return to Eden. I'm exiting the Damascus Gate coming from the Moslem Quarter. The old city of Jerusalem is divided into four parts, the Moslem Quarter, the Jewish Quarter, the Christian Quarter, and the Armenian Quarter. This Damascus Gate would be the entrance for the Moslems on their holy day of Friday when they make their way to the mosque for the purpose of offering their prayers and hearing the weekly sermon. During Ramadan and other Muslim holy days, Damascus Gate would be the entrance to the area of the Temple Mount, to the Holy Sanctuary as they refer to it, the location that is the third most holiest site in the world after Mecca and Medina for the Muslim people. The Muslim community is going to be a major force, a militia in the end times. Here in the book of Joel, chapter 2, it refers to the fact that there will be a force, a military force, like has never been seen upon the face of the earth, never will be seen ever again in the future. In the context of all of the prophetic scenario found in God's Word, I would have to speak of the Muslim militia that is, as I'm speaking, being formed. At this present time, there are 1.3 billion Muslim people in the world. The king of Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah, has called for the Muslim world to unite, to organize, to develop a Muslim militia for the purpose of fighting terrorism. Recently, another King Abdullah, this one the King of Jordan, when in Pakistan, called for that same unification, a uniting of the Muslim world to fight off the scourge of terror. In fact, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia said, we will rid the world of the scourge of terrorism. A mighty militia, the numbers of which this earth has never seen before. The world will never see it again to fight terror. Oh, the other thought is, the Muslim world considers Israel, the Jewish state, 
a terrorist state. And it's part of the whole concern that as you look as an observer of current events and a student of Bible prophecy, as you look at the prophetic scenario in God's Word, you see that that militia is formed to go to the Garden of Eden. That's Joel chapter 2 and verse 3. Like a fire, they make their way towards Jerusalem to the original site of the Garden of Eden. I'm standing here in a beautiful garden in the center of New City, Jerusalem, right behind the King David Hotel. I want to use this location for the purpose of showing the similarities between the original Garden of Eden, located at the place of creation, and what in the last days will be Jerusalem, in particular the Temple Mount. Isaiah 51, the book of Ezekiel chapter 36, and Joel chapter 2 talks about when God has established His kingdom with Jesus Christ, His Son, seated on the throne in Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount will look once again like the Garden of Eden. A beautiful location. There are some similarities between that original Garden of Eden and what will be the location where Jesus Christ will rule and reign in the future right here in Jerusalem. God gave dominion to the first Adam in the Garden of Eden. That's Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. To the second Adam, Jesus Christ, He will also give dominion in the Garden of Eden, right here on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And that's Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where God, through the prophet Daniel, says that Messiah Jesus Christ will have dominion from this location forever and ever. In Genesis chapter 2, we realize that there were at least two trees in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. As you study chapter 2, we realize there were many trees because this was a beautiful, lush garden. God said that they could eat of the tree of life, but not of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was in the Garden of Eden. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and verse 7, there will one day be a tree of life here, and Jesus Christ rules and reigns during that millennial kingdom. And we're not talking about Revelation chapter 22, where it talks about in the New Jerusalem, a tree of life. No, we're talking about the Temple Mount here in Jerusalem when he rules and reigns from the temple that will be standing behind me here on the Temple Mount or the original site of the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 2, one river flowed out of the Garden of Eden and then became four different heads. It was the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Pishon, and the Gihon. The Gihon River was the name of that river that flowed out of the Garden of Eden and then developed into four different rivers. The Garden of Eden, the site of the Temple Mount, where one day when the temple stands here, water will flow from the temple down to the Kidron Valley, and then to the Dead Sea. All of this originating in the Garden of Eden and in the Temple Mount, the same location right here in Jerusalem. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 13 says that Lucifer, who would become Satan after he rebelled against God, he was in the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago. The Bible says that one day in the future, when a temple stands here during the tribulation period, Antichrist will walk into that temple on the Temple Mount, the original site of the Garden of Eden, and be worshiped as he sits on the throne reserved for God on the Temple Mount here in Jerusalem. In the original Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, took of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
They did eat from the tree that God told them not to, and thus sin, the first sin, took place here in the Garden of Eden. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, was crucified on an extension of the Temple Mount at the altar without the gate on the Mount of Olives. There his crucifixion took care of that first sin, gave the cure for sin, right on the Garden of Eden Temple Mount area. After the sin of Adam and Eve, they realized that they were naked. God then took care of that situation by sacrificing an animal in the Garden of Eden. Jesus Christ became the ultimate sacrifice on the Temple Mount. And he took care of all the sin for each and every one that comes to him in the Garden of Eden on the Temple Mount. We've been talking about the Garden of Eden on this video. I want to stop and think with you just a few moments about what the scripture has to say about that actual location. Here in the beautiful garden on top of the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem, I'm reminded that it was on the third day of creation, the book of Genesis chapter one and verse nine, when God created the garden. In the book of Genesis also, it talks about the Garden of Eden and Adam placed in that garden. That's chapter two of the book of Genesis and verse eight. Verse 10 talks about a river. Many times people think there are a number of rivers located and connected with the Garden of Eden. The text says in chapter two, verse 10 of Genesis, one river flowed out and then someplace outside there were four rivers that came out of that one particular river. The rivers, the Pishon, the Gihon, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. Remember, the Garden of Eden was here before the flood. 1,500 years the Garden of Eden was on this particular spot. The flood, of course, changed the topography of the entire earth. But we have the Dome of the Rock here, and under that rock, the foundation stone is, is the location where the Jewish people believe that God created Adam and Eve. In fact, I talked with the Mufti of Jerusalem, Sheikh Sabri. He told me that this particular spot dated back to the times of Adam and Eve, and of course, the location of the Garden of Eden. Chaim Richman, the rabbi, told me that this was the location where the Jewish people for many years, over 5,700 years, have believed God created Adam and Eve. That would, of course, have been in the Garden of Eden, that foundation stone underneath the Dome of the Rock, the center of the Garden of Eden, as the scriptures tell us. When you go to prophecy over in the book of Isaiah, chapter 51 and verse 3, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36 and verse 35, and in Joel, chapter 2 and verse 3, it says that God will return the Garden of Eden to the Jewish people. Obadiah, in the 15th verse talks about the day of the Lord. In the 16th verse, it talks about the fact that the people that are the enemies of the Jewish people, the Edomites, Esau and the Palestinians, are going to try to control this spot. It says they will be drunk on the holy mountain of God. That phrase, holy mountain of God, is used in the Bible some 18 times, twice in the 28th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, where the Lord refers to Satan, Lucifer, the most prominent of all cherubim, Satan being in the Garden of Eden with him and then thrown out of the holy mountain of God. That holy mountain of God, the city of Jerusalem, Daniel chapter 9, verses 16 and 20, confirming this is the holy mountain of God, synonymous with the Garden of Eden. I've chosen this vantage point here on the slopes of the Mount of Olives 
to discuss the issue of the rivers as it relates to the Garden of Eden. Many people want to tell me that the Garden of Eden is located in Iraq, modern day Iraq, between the Tigris and the Euphrates. There are four rivers that are discussed in Genesis chapter 2, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Pishon, and the Gihon River. But it says in the text, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 10, there was only one river in the Garden of Eden that flowed out of the Garden of Eden and became four rivers someplace outside the Garden. Today, of course, we know where the Tigris and the Euphrates might be located. I'm going to tell you in a moment where the Gihon River is. I don't know anybody who knows where the Pishon River is. You remember, we know where those rivers are today, but that's a time period after the flood. Prior to the flood, we do not know where those rivers were located. Remember, the flood changed the topography of the entire earth. Now, this is key to understanding the location of the Garden of Eden. When I was in the city of David recently with the archaeologist responsible for the dig there, that's the area just south of the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah then, but the 10-acre plot, which was the original site of the city of Jerusalem, the archaeologist told me there was one river in the city of Jerusalem, the Gihon River. He gave me the proof text over in 1 Kings chapter 1, where it says that King David, on his deathbed, sent the servant to go to the Gihon River, get a pitcher of water, so that he could anoint his son Solomon to be king of Israel. That archaeologist has a son who is a Navy SEAL in the Israeli Navy, and he one day put on his scuba equipment, got down in the Pool of Siloam. You might remember that's there in the city of David, the location where the blind man, John chapter 9, having had the mud put in his eyes by Jesus Christ, went to wash his eyes and he was able to see. They got down in the Pool of Siloam, they swam up the Gihon underneath the Dome of the Rock there. They saw the water gushing out, the headwaters for the Gihon River. The one river in the Garden of Eden was the Gihon River. The word Gihon is used six times in the scriptures. In 1 Kings chapter 1, it's used twice. Over in 2 Chronicles chapters 31 and 33, it talks about the Gihon. That's the river that was in the Garden of Eden some 6,000 years ago. Flowed outside, became four rivers, the Pishon, the Gihon, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. But one river in the Garden of Eden, the Gihon, right here in the city of Jerusalem. And as I've made my way down through the city of David, here to the bottom of the hill, and in fact to the Gihon Springs, the Gihon, one of those rivers that emanated out of the Garden of Eden. Here in the book of Genesis, in chapter 2, it says that there was one river that came from the Garden of Eden, then divided into four heads, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Pishon, and the Gihon. It seems that everybody knows where the Tigris and the Euphrates are located in modern-day Iraq. Nobody's been able to tell me where the Pishon River is, but I do believe that we know where the Gihon River is, the source for the water here at Gihon Springs in the city of David, originally the Garden of Eden, right here in the city of Jerusalem. As in the original Garden of Eden, this garden here in New City, Jerusalem, has some very beautiful flowers and trees. In fact, Genesis chapter 2, God said, when I made the Garden of Eden, I put all the trees and the shrubs and the beautiful flowers in it. Then I created Adam, the first Adam, to take care of that garden. Well, the second Adam will have a beautiful location from which to rule and reign. When he rules and reigns in that temple, which will be majestic standing there on the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem. The Bible tells us what it will be like during the Millennial Kingdom. The animals, well, they'll lay down together. The lion will lay down with the lamb. The child will hold the poisonous snake in his hand, similar to how it was at the time of the Garden of Eden, at the time of creation. In fact, into the garden, God brought these animals to Adam and 
told Adam to name the animals. Then God said to Adam, I am giving you dominion over all that has been created. Now that was the first Adam. God will give the second Adam, Jesus Christ, dominion over all of creation when he rules and reigns from the city of Jerusalem. You know, one of those trees in that original Garden of Eden was the tree of life. You know what happens to those of us who are overcomers? The book of Revelation chapter 2 says those that are overcomers, and 1 John 5 says anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is an overcomer, will all be able to eat of the tree of life. There was a tree of life in that original garden, and there will be a tree of life on the Temple Mount during the Millennial Kingdom when Jesus Christ is reigning. There are many similarities between that original Garden of Eden and the location where Jesus Christ will rule and reign from, the Temple Mount. And I must remind you, the ancient Jewish prophets tell us that when Jesus Christ rules from this city of Jerusalem, from the Temple Mount, the Temple Mount and the city of Jerusalem will once again be restored to the Garden of Eden. The Temple Mount and the city of Jerusalem the most sacred piece of real estate in all of creation. And the location that for 6,000 years the Jews have believed is the Garden of Eden. As we bring to a conclusion our study of the return to Eden, I think the evidence weighs heavy that the Temple Mount is the original site of the Garden of Eden. In Ezekiel chapter 28, it refers to the Garden of Eden as the holy mountain of God. Now that phrase, the holy mountain of God, is used 18 times in the Bible. Two times it's referring to the Garden of Eden. The other 16 times it's talking about the Temple Mount right here in Jerusalem. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 3, in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 35, and in Joel chapter 2 verse 3, that God will return the Garden of Eden to this location. The evidence just mounts up, and the only conclusion we can have, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the original site of the Garden of Eden. The Jewish scholarship has been correct for these 6,000 years. One day, there will be a temple standing there. Jesus Christ will rule and reign from this city. That river of life will flow out of that temple down to the Dead Sea. One day there will be a tree of life there. Revelation 2 7 says we shall partake of that tree of life during the Millennial Kingdom, that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. In the Garden of Eden, God gave the first Adam dominion on the Temple Mount. He gives the second Adam Jesus Christ, dominion over all of creation, not only for a short period of time, but forever and forever and forever. Jesus Christ will rule and reign from the spot He created everything. He brought all into existence. He will rule and reign from that spot as He returns to the Garden of Eden.